Last time we talked about doubt, how to deal with doubt. And I, I thought tonight we'd talk about something that I know none of you probably struggle with, but the whole idea of worry, it's something we probably can't talk about uh, too frequently in some ways. Uh, there's a story about uh, uh, Henry uh, Ward Beecher, uh, one of his favorite stories about a young man who was applying for a job in a New England factory. And uh, he asked the owner, uh, and asking the owner, he found himself in the presence of a very nervous, fidgety man who looked hopelessly anxious. And the only vacancy, he told this uh, young man, he says, is the vice presidency of the company. And the man who takes the job has to shoulder uh, all of my cares. He says, well, that's a tough job. He says, what's the salary? He says, well, I'll pay you uh, $10,000 a year if you really take over all my worries. And he says, well, where's the $10,000 coming from? And that, my friend, said the owner, is your first worry. <laughs> Well, uh, the Bible has three main passages, really, that, that talk about the subject of worry. We've talked about these before, but I want to look at Matthew 6 tonight. The three passages, if you want to write them down, are uh, Matthew 6, where Jesus addresses the topic of worry. Um, and then Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, where Paul, the apostle, addresses the subject of worry. And then 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, where the apostle Peter uh, deals with the subject of worry or anxiety. So really, each of the three great uh, writers of the New Testament, Jesus and Paul and Peter, all have a section on worry. Now, the key one really, though, here is in Matthew chapter six, uh, verses twenty five to thirty four, where Jesus himself uh, talks about worry. Now, this, of course, is in the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus has just finished in uh, Matthew six, verses 19 through twenty four. Uh, talking about money and about possessions. Now, some have pointed out that in chapter six of, of uh, or ch- verses 19 to 24 of chapter six, he's kind of dealing with people there who have too much money, people who are rich and how they deal with money in their lives. And then at beginning in verse 25, he starts talking about people that don't have enough money that are tempted uh, to worry and to be preoccupied and doubt God's provision. Let me read these familiar Uh, passages or these familiar verses to us. Verse 25 says, for this reason, I say to you, do not be anxious. And there's the word to worry. Uh, That's the word uh, marimna or merimnao. Do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his life span? And why are you anxious about clothing? Otherwise, observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown in the furnace, will he not much more do so for you, O men of little faith? Do not be anxious then, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for each day will. And really, it's the word worry there again. Each day will worry for itself. Each day has uh, enough trouble of its own. Now, this is the most important section really in the Bible on uh, the topic of worry. And the word that's used here six times, again, at the noun is merimna, and the Greek and the, the verb is merimnao. Uh, the noun is found six times in the New Testament. The verb is found 19 times, but six of the times are here in this passage. Uh, verse uh, 25 mentions the word anxious. It's the word uh, to worry. Verse 27, it's in verse 28, uh, down in verse 31, and then twice in verse 34. Again, uh, the word Uh, For tomorrow will care for itself or tomorrow will worry uh, about itself. Um, There's a article I read not long ago. The number one selling medicines in America are medicines for people who have anxiety 
and people who have ulcers and all types of things that are can be often related to uh, stress and anxiety and, and, and worry. I read a great quote a while back. A person said ulcers don't come so much from what you eat as the what's eating on you. And uh, that's certainly true in the lives of, of many people. Uh, the word merimnao is made up of two Greek words, meridzo, which means to divide, and naos, which means the mind. So basically, it means to divide the mind or to pull your mind in different directions. Now, that is a very descriptive idea of what worry is, right? I mean, you just feel pulled in different directions. In fact, the uh, English word I have read, a uh, worry is from the German word, uh, worgen, or I guess it'd be vorgen probably in Germany, German, and it means to strangle. And so it means like to, literally to be choked or to feel like you're being torn apart. One person said it this way, says worry is the advance interest you pay on troubles that seldom come. And someone else has said this worry like a rocking chair will give you something to do, but it won't get you anywhere. That's true, isn't it? I mean, worry is just, you know, it gives you something to do for a while, but we all know that it really doesn't do anything. Now, one thing I want to point out, and this is very important, the word merimnao, to have a divided mind, there, in, in the Bible, we, we could say it like this, there's a good kind of worry and there's a bad kind of worry. Because the word worry, the same word, is used in a good sense. Like in Philippians 2.20, Paul talks about he doesn't have anyone else like Timothy who will be concerned for the people. And it's the same word there. So the whole idea of worry, it can just mean to be concerned in a good sense. Or it can mean to be worried in a bad sense. So there's a good kind of worry and a bad kind of worry. Now, we all know the difference, don't we? You know, we may hear something about someone and we're concerned about it, but we don't begin to experience anxiety and begin to be choked by it and to begin to be pulled apart and torn in two different directions. We all know, I think, in our own heart and mind, when we've crossed the line from a legitimate concern about things to being worried. I mean, there's a lot of things in life that we're legitimately concerned about. And I mean, if we weren't concerned about those things, there'd be something wrong with us. But there's a line we cross whenever we begin to be torn uh, in two different directions. Now, the first thing I want to look at here in the passage is what we might call the condemnation of worry. I mean, three times we're told here, don't worry. Don't worry about the necessities. Worry comes and begins to pull us apart and strangle us. And he's he's telling us here, don't even worry about necessities of life. Don't worry about food. Don't worry about clothing. Don't worry about drink. And Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. Be anxious for nothing. So we're not even to be anxious or to be worried about the very necessities of life. I mean, you'd think, well, I mean, if it gets down to where you didn't have enough food to eat, surely you're justified in being worried. Well, you'd be justified in being concerned, but you're not justified in crossing over the line uh, to be worried. Worry comes in and pulls us apart and strangles us. And worry is sin. There's no other way to state it from the Bible. In fact, I like what John Wesley said one time. He said, I would rather swear than worry. Now, there are a lot of people who are Christians. They'll never say a swear word, maybe, but uh, they'll worry themselves to death. And I would say a lot of them would be better off to swear every once in a while than spend every day of their life worrying all the time. It's a lot more deadly uh, in their spiritual life. It's a story I read or a quote. It says it's been reported that a dense fog extensive enough to cover seven city blocks, a hundred feet deep is composed of less than one glass of water divided into 60,000 million droplets in the right form. A few gallons of water can cripple a large city in a similar way. The substance of worry is nearly always extremely small compared to the size it forms in our minds and the damage it does in our lives. Someone has said worry is a thin stream of fear that trickles through the mind with which with which if encouraged will cut a channel so wide that all other thoughts will be drained out. 
Now, every one of us have experienced that before in our lives. Worry is like the threads uh, in Gulliver's travel. You remember the Jonathan Swift, you know, Lemuel Gulliver, you know, in the land of Lilliput, you know, the little strands that are tiny in and of themselves, but bound him and held him down. That's what worry does. It comes in and enslaves and immobilizes people and really paralyzes the people to act. It's like the strands of, a sle- of this thread that kind of immobilizes us to really do anything. Now, Mickey Rivers, who used to play, he played for the Yankees for a while and then the Rangers. He stated his philosophy of life like this. Ain't no sense worrying about things you got no you got control over, because if you got control over them, ain't no sense worrying. And if there ain't no sense worrying about things you got no control over either, because you ain't got no control over them. So there ain't no sense worrying. So if you got control over it, don't worry. And if you ain't got no control over it, don't worry about that either. I mean, that's pretty good philosophy of life. I like that. It was back in uh, the Dallas Morning News years ago. Another one kind of like that, you all have probably heard this, but a French soldier in World War I carried with him this little uh, receipt of worry. It says, of two things, one is certain, either you're at the front or you're behind the lines. This was back during World War I in battle. If you're at the front, uh, one of two things is certain, either you're exposed to danger or you're in a safe place. If you're exposed to danger, one of two things is certain, either you're wounded or you're not wounded. If you're wounded, one of two things is certain. Either you recover or you die. If you recover, there's no need to worry. If you die, you can't worry. So why worry? (laughs) Well, that's probably pretty good, I'm sure, in getting that person through the troubles in battle. But that's a very good question that all of us need to ask ourselves is really why worry? It's irrational. It doesn't do anything. I mean, it it does something. It does negative things, but it does nothing positive. It, It changes absolutely nothing except our own heart and our own attitude. But we try to do it over and over again. Now, it's clearly condemned in this passage as other places in the New Testament. What's the cause of worry? Why do we worry? Well, it's very simply the cause of worry is uh, unbelief. That's why we worry. This is something that's very important for us to realize is worry is just unbelief in disguise. Every one of us would would say, well, man, I don't want to have unbelief and not trust in God and not believe in God. That's all worry is. It's just sorry, old, ugly, unbelief and lack of trust in God. But it's in a disguise where we can kind of make it look a little bit better or seem a little bit better. Notice what he says in chapter six here in verse 30. He says, will God not do much more for you, O men of little faith? Notice down in uh, chapter 8 and verse 26, he says to his disciples, why are you timid, you men of little faith? In chapter 14 and uh, verse 31, Jesus again uh, speaking to his disciples says, oh, you of little faith, why uh, did you doubt? In chapter 16 and verse 8, you men of little faith. In uh, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20. He says to his disciples again, the son of man is uh, or he says, because of the littleness of your faith, truly, I say this to you. Notice again and again, Jesus chides his disciples for their lack of faith or their unbelief. Ultimately, worry is a blow against the love of God and the integrity of God. That's really what it is. It's a blow against God's integrity and against God's uh, love for us. Down in our text in verse 30, I mean, you couldn't say it any clearer. Oh, men of little faith. That's that's basically the cause of worry. So next time you begin to worry, you can put any kind of a happy face you want to put on it. But it's just unbelief. That's all it is. It's unbelief in disguise. And the sad thing is, I think, for a lot of us, worry is one of those kind of respectable kind of sins. Again, that people can do and, and they give themselves slack and they, they act like it's OK and we justify it. And we're, oh my, well, surely this is a good thing to worry about. You know, God won't mind if I worry about this. But the Bible clearly tells us don't worry about anything, but trust God for everything. Now, what's the content of worry? What do we worry about? Well, the bottom line is really everything. <laughs> I mean, people worry about everything. We worry about uh, the weather. Uh, people worry about their parents. Uh, Parents worry about their children. Uh, Young people worry about tests at school. People worry about their job. They worry about money. 
They worry about the stock market. They worry about their marriage. They worry about their health. Man, I'm surprised how many people I know who are constantly worried about their health. Every time they have some little pain or anything they have, you know, immediately think, oh, I, I got cancer, you know, I'm dying, you know, whatever. It's just a constantly enslaved to that type of worry. We worry about what other people will think about us. On and on we can go. We worry about all kinds of things. But notice in Matthew 6 here, there are really three main things he's saying here that people really worry about. If you want to kind of put it in broad categories. The first one, he says, is basically uh, our life. For this reason, do not be anxious for uh, your life. And it really is just referring to all the things of life. But also, probably it refers to our lifespan. Now, some translations in verse 27 say, you know, which of you by being anxious can add a single cubit uh, to his height? It's the, some, some translations have this idea that, you know, by worrying, you know, can you get taller? But probably here it's not referring to your height, but the span of your life. In other words, if you worry and worry and worry, you know, can you really add any time to your lifespan? Probably all you're going to do is take away from it, really, if you spend time in worry. But people worry uh, about their life, about the things of life and the length of their life. Uh, verse 31, we worry about our needs. Don't be anxious. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or with what shall we clothe ourselves? Just all of the needs and the temporal things uh, of this life. And the other thing that we really worry about is the future. We worry about tomorrow. And we see that in verse 34. Don't be anxious for tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care. will worry about itself. The rich worry about what's going to happen to their wealth. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us that very clearly. Let me uh, read a couple passages back there that I ran across this week that are pretty telling. Back in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. By it there. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and uh, verse 18. It says, For thus I hated all the fruit of my labor, for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. How many people who've made a lot of money sit around and worry about what the people after him are going to do with it? And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool? Yet, he will have control over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Somebody else is going to come along and they're going to have control over all that stuff that I've worked so hard for. Therefore, I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored under the sun. When there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them. This, too, is vanity and a great evil. A lot of times you hand things over to people who didn't have to work hard for it and people worry about it. Over in chapter 5 and verse 10, it says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. I mean, if we, if we could just put that verse uh, above uh, you know, every home and every business in America, it would change people's lives. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. He says, you know, the working guy, whether he eats a lot or he doesn't eat a lot, he can go to bed at night, but the rich man, even if his stomach's full, he can't sleep at night because he's worrying about the future. Charles Spurgeon called these three things, our life and our needs and the future. He called it the world's trinity of care. The three things that people spend their time worrying about. What worry does really when you think about it is it, it takes our mind captive with horizontal thoughts. Worry gets our mind just thinking constantly and we become obsessed with just the horizontal plane in life. And it takes away our focus on the vertical uh, plane in life. It focuses us on the means and not the ultimate end uh, that God has for us. I like what Corey Tin Boom said one time. She said this, Worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. 
I mean, worry's not going to empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It's not going to change that, but it empties today um, of its strength. The content of worry, what do we worry about? Everything. We worry about our life. We worry about our needs. We worry about tomorrow. All kinds of things that people find uh, to worry and to be uh, stressed out about. Now, what are the consequences of worry? Let me just mention a few things that worry does. And we all will see this, I think, as we look at these, each one individually. One of the most important things that we can think about that worry does that probably very few of us think about is worry chokes out the power of God's word in our lives. There are a lot of people who are struggling in their lives desperately in their spiritual life. And one of the reasons is, and they may be coming to church regularly, they may be reading their Bible regularly, but what's happening is, if they live their life in constant worry and anxiety, it's constantly choking out the effectiveness and the power of God's Word in their lives. It limits the ability of God to work in our lives through His Word. Look over in Matthew 13 and verse 22. Matthew 13 and verse 22 says, and the, this is the, the parable of the sower, and it says the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns. And of course, you remember in this parable, the seed here is the is the word of God. It's the message of the kingdom. And the sower here is the son of man or Jesus. But I think it refers to any time the word is sown or it's given out. It was sown among the thorns. This is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world. And the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Over in Mark chapter four, we have a parallel to this in Mark four, verse 18. It said, then others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word and the worries of the world. And the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes uh, unfruitful. In fact, over in uh, in Luke's gospel, in Luke eight and uh, verse fourteen, it says it says it this way: the seed which fell among the thorns; these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life, and they bring no fruit to maturity. Just think about this in your own mind if this hasn't happened before. It may be happening right now. It may be happening tonight. We come to a place, maybe you're sitting down to listen to or you're driving in your car listening to one of your favorite Bible teachers on the radio or you have a CD of someone you like to listen to or maybe you've come to church here on a Sunday morning or maybe it's in your Sunday school class on Sunday morning and you sit down there and you start hearing someone teach the Bible And as they're teaching the Bible, your mind is just constantly going to all these things. You know, the money you lost in the stock market last week or, you know, what your child that you're, you know, worried about over here, your parents or or uh, some health issue you have or whatever it is. And it begins to divide your mind and pull you apart. And you know what happens to the to the word of God? The the, uh, thorns and thistles come in and they choke it out. It's not effective in your life. Or maybe you don't think about it during the service, but when you leave, the first thing you do, you know, when you walk outside and you get in the car or whatever, and you're driving off is you begin to all these things begin to come in your mind, all the stuff you got to do the next day or all these different things. You just begin to worry. And the Bible never has time, the word of God, to get into your life and to take root, which is the purpose of hearing and studying the word to bring forth a harvest um, in our lives. The if you read the parable, of the sowers, the really the harvest, the main thing, the harvest is dependent upon is the degree of the preparation of the soil and the soil in each of those uh, four of the four different kinds pictures the human heart and the degree to which God's word will have effect in your life and my life to hear it, to change us and to transform us depends on when we hear it the degree of the preparation of our own heart. And if our heart isn't prepared to hear it, and all we're doing is worrying about the cares of this life and the pleasures of this life and the riches of this life, the Word of God's never going to take hold. There are a lot of people 
who are Christians who go to church regularly, listen to Bible teachers regularly, all those kinds of things. The word of God, as Luke puts it, it never comes and brings the fruit of maturity in their lives because their life's filled with worry. It's a dreadful consequence of worry in our lives. Another thing that worry does is it clouds our focus on uh, the blessed hope on the future that God has for us over in Luke's gospel in Luke uh, chapter 21 and uh, verse 24, Luke 21 and 24. It focuses us on the tomorrow's trouble, makes us dull and makes us uh, unalert. Well, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to go ahead and read. That's a passage there that talks about what's coming in the future, but it's, it looks at people's hearts. They're fainting from fear and the worries that they have. But it, it focuses us on the troubles of tomorrow is what worry does. You think about when you're worried, you're never thinking about the great things that are going to happen tomorrow. You're thinking about the problems that are going to happen. You're thinking about tomorrow's troubles, not tomorrow's triumphs or the good things that God has. And one of the things that worry does in our lives, it makes us dull and makes us unalert to spiritual things. And it clouds the focus of the blessed hope that we have in Christ. Another thing that worry does is it crowds out our focus on the most important things. One of those, of course, is worship over in uh, Luke 10. You all are familiar about that with the passage where Martha and Mary are there uh, with Jesus in Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. Some have called Martha here, you know, Martha Stewart, you know, she's uh, working and laboring and Mary is seated there at Jesus's feet. It says as they were traveling along, he entered a certain village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who moreover was listening to the words, Lord's words, seated at his feet. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. She came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sisters left me to do all the serving alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. But only a few things are necessary, really only one. And that's an amazing statement. There's really just a few things that are necessary, really only one thing. Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now, what was the one necessary thing that Mary was doing? She was sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his word. That is the one necessary thing in life. Jesus said there's a lot of things uh, that are that are necessary, but really there is one main thing in life, and that is to sit at the feet of Jesus and to listen to his word. That is the ultimate thing. And one of the things that worry does is it crowds out our focus on that most important thing in life. I challenge you to really pick up your Bible and really read it and meditate on it when you're all worried about stuff. You, you, don't, you don't even really want to do it. But you won't be able to focus in on that which is most important in life. I read a great quote a few years ago, said this, the average person is crucifying himself between two thieves, the regrets of yesterday and the worries of tomorrow. You think about that. That's true, isn't it? The average person crucifies their self every day between the regrets of yesterday and the worries about tomorrow. God doesn't want us to live in the past having all the regrets and the guilt over things that have happened. He wants us to realize those things are under the blood of Christ. And He doesn't want us to be crucifying ourself between the thief of worrying about tomorrow, but He wants us to live uh, for today and to follow His uh, will for our lives. The other thing that uh, worry does is it consumes our joy. You will never find a really worried person who's joyful. They're, they're mutually exclusive. It's one of the primary joy stealers in life. You know, if you read the book of Philippians, where you have that great section in Philippians 4, 6 and 7, you know, don't worry about anything. But in all things, by prayer and supplication, you know, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. What is the theme of the book of Philippians? It's joy, isn't it? Eighteen times different, the different forms of the word joy are used in that book. And worry is placed there as one of the great joy stealers. Um, in our lives. So, you know, if if you if you're not convinced already in your life that worry is bad, I mean, it's just the physical things it can do to you, but it's going to choke out the word. It's going to cloud your focus 
on the blessed hope. It's going to crowd out your focus on what's really most important. It's going to just keep your life constantly on the horizontal plane. And it's going to consume your joy. It'll just devour it all up. Now, what's the cure uh, for worry in our lives? Now, this is where we get down to where the rubber really meets the road. And what I want to encourage all of us to do is I want you to hear the things that we're saying. But whenever you're tempted tonight, tomorrow, next week to worry, think about these three things. Now, I've broken them down just into three words so that we can remember these uh, very easily. These three words now. We're not just told not to worry, but God gives us logical, practical, demonstrable reasons not to worry. Three reasons for not worrying, and they can be discerned in this passage from the three uses of the word uh, therefore. Notice in uh, verse 25, for this reason, I say to you, uh, do not be anxious. Then notice in uh, verse uh, 26, where he says, Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, cannot add a a, a, a cubit span to their lives because all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek down uh, in verse 34 as well. Uh, Eagerly seek these things. Your father knows that you need all these things, but seek first his kingdom and righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious uh, for tomorrow. So he's using these Uh, transition terms here to give us these three ideas. And really what he's saying in verse 24 and verse 25, he's basically saying this. He's saying that we should not worry, first of all, because God is our master. That's the first point in verse 24 and verse 25. In verse 26 to 31, it's because God is our creator and provider is the point he's making. And verse 32 and 34, it's because God is our father. That's kind of broadly speaking, but I want to boil it down even simpler and just look at three key words as kind of the antidote here for us to anxiety. And the first one in verse 30 is the word faith. If the if the real problem with 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 worry is that it's unbelief, then the real antidote to worry would be faith. Right. I mean, it just makes sense. That's the cure or that's the remedy. Uh, The beginning of anxiety, George Mueller said, is the end of faith and the beginning of faith is the end of anxiety. Whenever we have trust in God and faith in God, we won't worry. And when we are worrying, we really are not trusting God and we don't have faith in him. That's exactly uh, what is stated for us in the scriptures. And what he says here, he says, look, when it comes to food, just look at the birds. I mean, verse 26, look at the birds of the air. That they don't sow, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? I like what uh, William Barclay says. He says, worry is blind. Worry refuses to learn the lesson of nature. Jesus bids men look at the birds and see the bounty which is beyond nature and trust the love that lies behind that bounty. Worry refuses to learn the lesson of history. There was a psalmist who cheered himself with the memory of history. Oh, my God, he cries, my soul is cast down within me. And then he goes on. Therefore, I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Midzar. When he was up against it, he comforted himself with the memory of what God had done. The man who feeds his heart on the record of what God has done in the past will never worry about the future. Worry refuses, he also says, to learn the lesson of life. We are still alive and our heads are still above water. And yet if someone had told us that we would have to go through what we have actually gone through, we would have said it was impossible. The lesson of life is that somehow we've been able to bear the unbearable and to do the undoable and pass the breaking point and not to break. The lesson of life is that worry um, is unnecessary. It's interesting. I was talking with uh, A friend of mine here uh, a while back, and he's in a Christian ministry, and he was really honest. I really appreciated his honesty. I was talking to him about a need they had, and they needed uh, for this ministry to finish this building out that they were building. They needed seventeen thousand dollars. And he was, you know, said he's just honest. He said, I was worrying myself to death about it. And he said uh, the next morning that we really got down to it, some guy from another town 
another city called and, and gave him seventeen thousand dollars. And he called me and he was so excited about it. I'd been praying with him about this need. And I said, man, that that is really going to build your faith. You know what his response to me was? He says, no, it won't. <laughs> he said, I've been here time and time again. He says, every time I get here, it seems like I worry just as bad as I did the time before. You know, no matter what God's done for me in the past. You know, I, what I appreciated his honesty about that, though. You know, that God does these things for us. And, you know, this thing happened. You say, boy, that'll really build my faith. And he was being facetious. I mean, he knows what the Bible says and he knows that it will build his faith. But he was just being honest about his own weakness and how he gets himself back in this spot every time. And the next time he's in it, he'll face the same type of struggle that he did before. But it's beneficial to look back and to see uh, what God has done for us in the past. You know, he says, look, when it when it comes to, to food, look at the birds. And then he says, when it comes to clothing, look at the flowers. I mean, look at verse 28. Why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They don't toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you, Solomon in all his glory didn't clothe himself like one of these. God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today, tomorrow is thrown into the furnace. Will he not do so much more for you, O men? Of little faith. He's saying, look, there's no need to worry about tomorrow. Uh, God is already there to meet our needs. Another thing that's in this to me of faith is that we need to lay hold of is you remember that verse in Romans eight where it says that if God did not spare his own son, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? In other words, it's an argument from the greater to the lesser. If God has taken care of the greatest need you're ever going to have, if God did not spare his own son, but he gave his son for you, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? If God has taken care of the biggest problem that we have, which is our sin problem, can we trust God to take care of the lesser problems that we have? I mean, Sometimes you would wonder with some of us the way we worry whether we've ever really trusted God to take care of that biggest problem or not. Um, Have we really trusted him to take care of our sins, the sin problem? If so, then we ought to be able to trust him uh, with the lesser problems of life as well. You know, our church, after all, is called Faith Bible Church, isn't it? (laughs) And uh, we're called upon every week and we drive in here. We see uh, we're focused on the Bible. We're a church. We're a body of believers, but to trust God and to have our faith in him. So the first word to remember when you start the worry is faith. The second word to remember is the word father. Verse 32. Notice in verse 32, he says, for all these things, he's talking about food and clothing and all the stuff of this life, what you're going to eat and drink and wear. Notice he says, All these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. These are the things that pagans are seeking after passionately in their lives. Their life is lived completely on the horizontal. It's about getting stuff. Your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Notice he refers to uh, God here as um, our heavenly Father. If we have worry, we need to remember that it's unbelief. We need to get ourselves and our mind in a position of faith in the Lord. The second thing we need to do is remember that God is our Father and that He cares about us. He's our Heavenly Father. Now, if God is our Heavenly Father, then we can pray to Him. Philippians 4, 6, Don't be anxious for anything, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard or fortress your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So if God is our father, then uh, we can pray to him. Verse 32 there says, for all these things, the Gentiles eagerly seek for your heavenly father. He knows that you need all these things. One translation puts it this way. He knows what we need. God knows what we need. He's our father. So God's our father. We can pray to him. God is our father so we can cast our cares upon him. That's the first Peter five, seven. We can cast or throw all of our worries upon him because he is mindful of us 
and of our interests. God thinks about you. God is mindful of you and the problems and the difficulties you have in life as your loving father. So if God's my father, I can pray to him. Um, he, he knows what I need. Um, I can cast all my cares upon him because he thinks about me. Now, remember, first Peter five, seven was written by the greatest warrior in the world. The Apostle Peter. I mean, here he is in his 60s. He's finally learned the lesson. I like what James Boyce says about him. He says in the early days of his association with Jesus, the Apostle Peter was worried about many things. Walking toward Jesus upon the water, he began to look at the waves and became so worried he began to sink. He was worried Jesus might not pay his taxes in Matthew 17. At one point, he was worried about who might betray Jesus. He was worried that Jesus might have to suffer and so rebuked him on one occasion and sought to defend him with a sword on another. Peter was a great worrier. But after he came to know Jesus better, he learned that Jesus was able not only to take care of himself, but also to take care of Peter. Thus, toward the end of his life, In his first epistle, he wrote to other Christians telling them how to live, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. We see the the transformation over the years in the life of a man who learned uh, to trust in Jesus and who learned uh, that God is uh, his father. God is our father. So really, we should never, ever worry about anything. You know, uh, when my sons were little, um, I can guarantee you at least 99% of the time, they didn't worry about anything. Now, that may not be true of some kids in our culture today, unfortunately. I think a lot of kids have things to worry about in our culture. It's tragic. But I know when I was a kid growing up, and I think my kids were the same way, if you have you know, parents who love you, going back to this whole idea of a father, a heavenly father, if you have a father who cares about you and loves you, You don't worry about your clothes, at least when you're real little. When you get to be a teenager, maybe you do. But when you're small, you don't worry about clothes or food. You don't worry about their life. They don't worry about drink or money or cars or on and on. Why is that? Because they have a father. They have someone that they know loves them, and they know that will take care of them. I like what one writer says. A child doesn't worry all day long whether his house will be there when he gets home from school or whether his parents will have a meal for him that evening. And again, this is in context of if you have a a loving father like the Lord. Children don't worry about such things because they trust their parents in the same way we as Christians should trust our heavenly father to supply what is best for us. So the next time you're tempted to worry, think about the word faith. Because worry is unbelief. Think about faith. Trust God. And think about God as your Father. He knows what you need. You can go to Him and take it to Him in prayer. And He will uh, provide for us. You can cast all your cares upon Him. He's mindful of you. He cares about you just as much as you care for your children. In fact, He cares more than we care for our own children. The third key word I see in this passage that Jesus gave us here is the word first. In verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Faith and then father and then the word first. When we seek God in his interests, which is to be our preoccupation and to be our highest love and our highest aim, then these lower interests of life, these interests and these cares will be diminished and often driven out of our lives. One of the problems when we're worrying is we are focused and preoccupied with lower and lesser things and not with God and his interests. I love what Charles Spurgeon said one time. He says, if you will mind God's business, God will mind your business. That's a tremendous thing to consider. If I will make God's business my focus, make him and his work my focus, then I can trust God to take care of my business. When something transcendent and captivating captures my attention and preoccupies my mind, we tend to forget about the cares and the worries of this life. If we will seek first God and His interests and His righteousness in our lives, what He's telling us here is God will take care of the other things in our lives and we will not... I need to worry about them. 
There's a story I've told this before, but it's one of my favorite stories. Well, it's really my favorite one about worry. It says this, it says in one of the early Greek manuscripts from the first centuries of the Christian era, there's a record of a man whose name was Titidios Amarimnos. The first part of that name is a proper name, the name Titidios. But the second part of his name is made up of the Greek word for worry. Remember, the word for worry was Marimnos or Marimnao. But it also has the letter A in front of it, which means not. You know, the word, the letter A in front of a word negates the meaning of the word. So ah, marimnos would mean to not worry or to never worry. In other words, the writer says here, the second name is a descriptive epithet, like the second part of like Frederick the Great or James the Just. In this case, many have thought that this man was originally a pagan who constantly worried but who after he became a Christian, stopped worrying. He was then called Titidios Amarimnos, or Titidios, the man who never worries. And the writer here who writes this statement says this, can you add that statement to your name? Can, you should be able to write Mark you know, Amarimnos or Joe Amarimnos or whatever our first name is. We ought to be able to say about ourselves, you know, Mark, the one who never worries. That's what each one of us should be able to say, because we have every reason to trust God, to have our faith in him. He's taking care of the biggest problem we're ever going to have. Um, He is our father who cares about us. He's mindful of us. He knows what we need. And if we will put him and his interests uh, first in our lives, we can stop worrying If we will do those three things, but many people are filled in their lives with unbelief. They really don't trust God that he's really their father, that he's really mindful. He really cares about them. And we seek first all the other things of this life and then worry about them rather than seeking him first in his interests and trusting him to take care of the other needs in our lives. Great verse in Isaiah 26 that says the steadfast of mind thou wilt keep in perfect peace because he trusts in thee. Trust in the Lord forever. For in God, the Lord, we have an everlasting rock. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you tonight and each one of us probably have the desire tonight to confess to you the sin of worry. Father, it creeps into our hearts and our minds so easily. It comes in and begins to to pull us apart, to choke us and to strangle us off from our fellowship with you. Father, help us in our lives not to sugarcoat worry, not to excuse ourselves for it. Help us, Father, to call it what it is, that it's just unbelief and disguise in our lives. Help us, Father, to to deal ruthlessly with worry in our hearts and minds. Lord, we thank you for this word from Jesus that we've considered tonight. Thank you, O God, that you are the Lord. You are everlasting rock we can trust in. Lord, I pray tonight for each one of us that we won't just be hearers of this word walk out of here and let the cares of this life choke it out. But we'll be doers of it. And then in the coming days, as worry begins to try to worm its way into our mind, that we will remember that we need to have faith in you, that you're our father, and we need to put your interests first in our life. Father, help us to remember this prescription for winning over worry in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.